All right, so the Canadian government revealed today that it is preparing for a nuclear war to break out in Europe. Go figure. Not at all surprising that 18 months after the war of our generation started, the highest intensity conflict since World War II that had all kinds of nuclear implications that had the potential to take us to the brink of nuclear Armageddon since it started, only now is the government dusting off their Cold War era playbook and trying to revise their emergency protocols. Now, chances are they've been up to this and thinking about it for a long time because, of course, continuity of government is number one with these people. You would think that the silver lining of any apocalyptic scenario would be the lack of government. Sure, everything would be in a radiated wasteland, but in the very least, we wouldn't have to deal with the overregulating governments and Justin Trudeau's taxation tyranny. But it appears as though that is not the case. This is what they are up to. I'm going to read you some snippets of an article that was released today, and I'm not at all surprised that they waited for so long to do this. Because had they come out with this initially, it would have spooked a lot of people into not wanting to support the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, which is not going well for Ukraine. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But guys, this is not going to be nearly as compendious as a daily dose of doom and gloom as you're accustomed to. I've been working on things on my end, trying to put myself strategically in a better situation. We're doing a lot of warehouse restructuring right now. I'm in the process of doing some off-grid projects. And what that means is that my time to allocate towards the daily dose is limited. But don't worry, we have some big plans in the future. Let's hope there's a future. Now, this is what's going on. The nuclear threat from Ukraine has prompted Ottawa to update its plans for catastrophe. Again, this is something that they've probably been thinking about for a long time, but they just didn't want to make this public until now. Not many people realize, but the Canadian government actually did once have a formidable network of fallout shelters throughout the country. In fact, there's a map on Google that shows all of the fallout shelters that are in Canada. A lot of them are now defunct. They're no longer in existence, but you can still see the place on the map. A lot of these were just retrofitted police station basements, uh, postal, like anything that had related to government because there's a lot of remote communities with very low population densities in the nether regions of Canada where, of course, they cannot afford to put all of the critical infrastructure that you're going to need to withstand direct nuclear hits. Not that not many nuclear targets will be in Canada. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But these were primarily for the purpose of surviving fallout and measuring radiation across the country so they could map out fallout in such case that the dust settled and, uh, you know, they had to rebuild their whole taxation scheme, i.e. government, right? So you can actually go and see that online. And so what they're doing right now is they're updating. And what it really amounts to is they need a way to ensure that all of the High-ranking officials from the federal and provincial governments can be shuttled off to safety so they can continue the work of government thereafter. Now, this is something I'm an advocate for. Uh, all jokes aside, of course, you know, one of the central things we're going to need is some centralized system of regulating things. And I know that sounds bad, but when you're in a disaster situation, the only way you get out of that situation is if you have some measure of centralized control to allocate what little resources might remain. So I'm, I commend the Canadian government for actually taking some initiative here, but it should have happened a long time ago. It didn't because they didn't want to spook people out of support for the war. Anyway, so what they're doing is they're dusting off and updating emergency protocols to deal with fallout, no pun intended, from possible tactical nuclear exchange in Europe or the spread of radiation across the ocean from a Ukrainian power plant explosion. Now, it has absolutely nothing to do with the latter, okay? They're not worried about a Chernobyl like situation. That's not what this is about. This is about a global nuclear exchange that might be initiated by some tactical nuclear exchange that has a chain reaction and it works its way up the nuclear level. Because recall, the some people within NATO 
would call for the invocation of Article 5, even if there was a limited nuclear incident in Ukraine, because that would have negative effects on the surrounding countries, whether it's radiation blows in or otherwise, and they would consider that an attack on NATO, which may require them to get involved, which could quickly, at least in theory, of course, this war is not exactly unfolding as many people had initially thought it would, thank God, but uh, in theory, it could get bad quite quickly. Okay, so essentially, Global Affairs Canada, last year, they procured potassium iodide pills as a precaution. Potassium iodide was all the rage last year because many people thought, number one, there was risk of nuclear power plant meltdown. And in the case of a global nuclear conflict, a lot of these nuclear power plants would be left either unattended, they would not be able to be maintained in the proper way, and that in and of itself would be a secondary catastrophe on top of the nuclear war catastrophe. So the nuclear power plants in it, in it, any Armageddon scenario are as much of a risk as the nuclear bombs themselves. So under the Federal Nuclear Emergency Plan, public safety would coordinate communication to the public about an international nuclear event. Basically, you would get a message on your phone saying that the bombs are inbound and don't worry, we're going to make sure Justin Trudeau survives. They would also, a timely and well-coordinated response will be necessary to address public concern and high-risk perception and maintain trust in government. They, they don't even try to to uh, conceal their true motives with all this. I'll say that again. A timely and well-coordinated response will be necessary to address public concern and high-risk perception and maintain trust in government. Now, as much as I realize they're trying to deceive us here, they're trying to encourage people to trust the government because you want people to behave as much as possible. You don't want criminals to think that there's no law and order. So I can see it from that perspective, but this is just another reason why you should absolutely not entrust in government for the security and safety of your family in a national disaster scenario such as what a nuclear war situation would be. I mean, they can't even uh, properly manage a limited regional disaster scenario. So on a national scale, you're on your own. You are going to be your own ambulance. You are going to be your own firefighter, your own police officer. You will be your own first responder. And every other thing that the government com does right now for you, whether it's education hospitals, whatever service they provide, you are going to have to fulfill that role, which is why I am so focused right now on doing the things that I need to do to get myself in a position should this thing pop off. The notes also say public safety and the Privy Council office were doing a rapid refresh of the continuity of constitutional government plan intended to ensure essential executive, legislative, and judicial process can take place during a major calamity. They got to make sure that Revenue Canada is still working. The plan sets out, okay, no more tax jokes, guys. The plan sets out a process for relocating key institutions, uh, including the Prime Minister's Office, the Federal Cabinet, Parliament, and the Supreme Court to an alternative site outside the National Capital Region. This used to be the Defen Bunker. That was the big bunker, kind of like, I don't know what you guys have, like a Mount Weather there in the United States. We don't have much up here, but we have the Defen Bunker, and I'm pretty sure that they have more updated stuff that we don't even know about. And you wouldn't want the enemy to know about it because, of course, it wouldn't make sense for them to know about it. The whole point of it being survivable, uh, even if they are built to withstand a direct hit, you don't want your adversaries to know where they are. So I'm quite certain that we have new defen bunkers that we don't even know about that are entirely classified. The internal notes also say that a national missile warning protocol had been ratified. An initial engagement with the provinces and territories had taken place. So don't be surprised if we get another emergency message on our phone and who knows what it's going to be disguised as, and it is going to be some kind of test. Now in other countries, they actually have apps on their phones that direct them to the nearest fallout shelters. China in particular, in the province that is opposite Taiwan, 
people there have apps on their phones that will direct them to the nearest bomb shelters. Okay, so there are countries in the world that are doing more for their populations, but because Canada is such a huge country and so sparsely populated, relatively speaking, it is very difficult for the Canadian government to provide Canadians with all the necessities, especially as is, I mean, the cost of everything is so high right now, the government can barely keep itself in power without a rebellion starting here because the cost of living situation, if World War III doesn't get us, that is what's going to eat Canadians alive right now. I have a sneaking suspicion that percolating under the surface is a lot of discontent, not only with the native population here, but uh, also with the immigrant population, people who came here thinking that they were going to have a better life only to find out they have to work two or three jobs just to stay in a state of perpetual debt and uh, just everything. The bubble is either going to explode or there's going to be a revolution. Anyways, more on that in another, another video. So this is what they're preparing for. They are preparing for things to go badly in Europe. It should be of concern that they weren't preparing for this 18 months ago, but this is how the government works. Now, what I will say, the way that the war is being prosecuted in Ukraine is very similar to how a nuclear war would be waged on a global scale. So contrary to popular belief, the Russians wouldn't just start nuking our major cities. Unless it was in response, they would likely uh, hold them for ransom after they took out the primary uh, military targets and critical infrastructural targets. But how the Russians are processing this special military operation, as they call it, it really is a microcosm for how they would wage a nuclear war. What do I mean by that? Well, the first primary targets for Russia right now are military targets, okay? And then they started hitting the critical infrastructure. Now they are starting to get a little bit closer to the civilian areas, and they're starting to be a bit more indiscriminate in their bombing, which means more collateral damage. And the more the war goes on, uh, the closer and the greater the likelihood that you're going to see more of these civilian areas targeted, be it because they are assisting in some way the war effort, or perhaps, uh, perhaps they're being used as human shields or something to that effect. And in like this humanitarian corridor with a grain deal, the suspicion was is that this was a way that perhaps weapons were getting in or out or you know, that this was a way that Ukraine was working to, to fortify their military industrial complex under the guise of this humanitarian corridor, okay? So it's the age-old using various things as shields in order to uh, protect against, uh, protect their military assets. So this is how a nuclear war would be waged on a global scale. The primary targets are going to be military first and foremost, then they're going to start targeting our critical infrastructural systems. The last thing the Russians want is for all of our nuclear plants, especially along the East Coast, where most of them are concentrated, to be completely destroyed, unmanageable, and all that radiation after a nuclear war. And I know it sounds crazy talking about post nuclear war, but after a nuclear war, many people think it's still survivable. The whole nuclear winter uh, phenomena is still hypothetical, largely. I'm not saying it's not there, but there are a lot of nuclear experts who disagree with that prognosis that we would go into a nuclear war or nuclear winter situation. And there's a lot of disagreement on exactly how many nukes would get through, what a mutually assured destruction scenario would look like, and an ideal World War III scenario from the Russian and Chinese perspective, what they would do is they would immediately try to neutralize as much of our nuclear triad as they possibly could. That would be the first primary target, the nuclear triad. They're working on finding ways to target the submarines. That's really the only right now unbeatable part of the NATO nuclear triad are the submarines, but the Russians are working on solutions for that. Also, if they can defeat all that, they don't even necessarily have to start nuking our cities. In fact, they don't necessarily want to. In fact, it's much more advantageous for them to be the only ones left standing with nuclear weapons 
when the smoke clears, and then they can imperialize, colonialize us without having to necessarily even bring any military over here because they could just threaten to nuke us if we don't comply. That's what it would essentially come down to. Who has the most nukes remaining? And so they would work their way from the nuclear triad. Then they would start taking out various military bases where there's large concentrations of troops. Then maybe they would start targeting uh, critical infrastructure, like big projects like the Hoover Dam, uh, you know, some of our highways here in Canada take billions of dollars and take years in order to develop. And honestly, one tactical nuke would completely destroy the Canadian highway system, at least as it transits the, in the West anyways, connecting East to West. It would not be difficult to make it almost impossible for cross-country travel here in Canada. So they would do that and then they might ultimately work their way up in a tit-for-tat exchange if Moscow was leveled, which I presume most of Washington's nukes are pointed at Moscow, then they would likely take out some major cities. There's no doubt about that, but not all because you want to keep some cities alive. Now, in terms of what's going on in Ukraine, your guess is as good as mine. Right now, Odessa is being bombed into oblivion. And it appears as though that the Ukrainians' uh, air defense, which has been formidable up to this point, is now failing in large numbers. Before, the Ukrainians would only admit to losing maybe 10%. 10% uh, of Russia's missiles actually make it through. Now, they're admitting that nearly 50% of Russia's missiles are making it through, especially in the Odessa region, which is where a lot of people think the Russians are going to make their next move or that that is the end goal for them to take over that city. And what that means is that they're likely only intercepting around 25%. So it's not looking good for Ukraine. We are definitely losing in this conflict. And if you believe the NATO shills, then you believe that if Ukraine falls, then it's World War III. Yet if Russia says if Ukraine wins, then it's World War III. So we're kind of damned if we do, if we're damned if we don't. The NATO perspective is that the Russians will continue their advance into Ukraine and then they'll come up on Poland and that's where World War III is going to ultimately start, which is why the Canadian government is now, only now, preparing their plans because maybe they think we're actually going to lose there. And uh, But as far as the Ukraine continuing to get funding, from NATO, I think that they're going to get as much funding as they need. I think they have a plan now for the next four years because you guys have to keep in mind as much money as you're sending Ukraine, as much as it seems, as long as they don't have to have our guys coming back in body bags, in coffins, for them, it's worth it from a PR perspective. And I know that sounds terrible and I'm not an advocate for any of this. I want to make that abundantly clear. But that's the way they view it. They're exchanging Ukrainian lives for Western resources and military equipment. And that is the current relationship that we have with that situation. And it's not look like, looking like it's going to improve anytime soon. Now, that is not all Canada is preparing for. In South Korea today, for the first time in 40 years, a U.S. nuclear submarine docked there. This is in response to a volley of uh, ballistic missiles that were fired by the North Koreans, test missiles, of course, into the Sea of Japan in the past couple weeks. So there are, now there's a nuclear-armed submarine, a U.S. submarine, in South Korea, sending a clear message to the North Koreans. In Taiwan... There's a record number of Chinese warships circulating Taiwan as we speak. 16, I do believe, which of course means that the tension there is rising as well. In the Strait of Hormuz in Iran, you have U.S. Uh, committing F-35s and I believe some warships as well into that region as a result of uh, Iranian intercepts of commercial uh, vessels through there. So it's not looking good on pretty much every front. The war is escalating. The cost of living is through the roof. Canada is burning down. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look like there's a, a good prospect for getting these fires up here 
out of control anytime soon. I'm going to try to keep you guys updated with everything that I know. But all you need to know is that the Canadian government has finally admitted what they probably should have admitted 18 months ago, that they're preparing for nuclear war in Europe. And if you know how incompetent the government is, I would encourage you to prepare to have a little bit of a contingency plan as well. It's just insurance. Doesn't mean you need to run off into the woods and uproot your life and take your family into the wilderness away from society. It just means you got to have a contingency plan, guys, because they're looking out for themselves. They basically just told you in plain English that they are they're looking out for themselves and their whole their sole concern is maintaining trust in government look at that i've been talking so long in the car that the lights went out ain't that kind of that's kind of creepy jesus anyways guys i gotta go thanks for watching we'll talk soon canadian prepper out